on to our next speaker. So up next, we have Chris Thorogood. He has sent in a brilliant video for us to watch, as unfortunately he was unable to join us today. Um, but you've, if you do have any questions, Chris has asked that you tweet um, at him on Twitter, um, and his Twitter handle will be written in the chat. Um, Tom, can I just ask you to pop up the video for us? Perfect, thank you. So Chris um, is the Deputy Director and Head of Science of the University of Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum, uh, Arbor Arbor um, and in Biology at the University of Oxford's Department of Plant Sciences. He's also a broadcaster, wildlife artist, botanical illustrator, and an international best-selling author of specialist field guides and popular titles. Um, so, Tom, if you're able to play this for us, that'd be great. My name is Chris Thurigood. I'm the Deputy Director and the Head of Science here at the University of Oxford Botanic Garden. And today I'm going to be talking about these curious plants, the broom rapes. Specifically, I will talk about parasitic plants, the broom rape family, the importance of broom rapes around the world, then we'll do a, a deeper dive into the life cycle of a broom rape. I'll introduce some of the British and Irish species, and then I'll mention some propagation and conservation success stories. Just a little bit about me before I get into the detailed part of the talk. I have a, a lifelong passion for these curious plants, and as a botanical illustrator, I've spent a long time painting them as well, and some of my illustrations feature in this talk. Rapes are parasitic plants that belong to a family of parasites called the Orobanchaceae. And we can divide those very broadly into those that are hollow parasites, which are completely devoid of chlorophyll, photosynthesis and functional leaves, and the hemiparasites, which have retained leaves and chlorophyll and they do photosynthesize. And today I'm going to focus on the plants on the top right, the Orobanchi and the Felopanchi, which collectively are known as the broom rapes. Before we explore the British and Irish species of broom rape, I'd just like to briefly examine Cystanchi, sometimes known as the desert hyacinth, a very impressive relative which grows in deserts in the old world. And together with my colleagues, Professor Julie Hawkins, our student Majid and others in Kew and in China, We've been examining the taxonomy of this confused and difficult genus of plants. Cystanchi has sometimes been harvested unsustainably from wild populations for herbal medicine or for food. And actually there's an opportunity to grow Cystanchi as an ancillary crop alongside shelter forests, which are planted now widely to halt land degradation, which is a, a growing global crisis. And that would enable us to grow this plant in a more sustainable way and avoid harvesting threatened wild populations. Let's examine the life cycle of a broom rape. From left to right, you can see the tiny dust-like seeds, very much magnified here. They're like orchid seeds and they're wind dispersed. If they land within reach of a suitable host root, they will germinate and then they attach to the root, as you can see there, and in a compatible interaction, they'll produce that swollen tuber, that orange structure you can see in the middle, which siphons off more and more nutrition via a, a structure called a horstorium, which is a, a bridge between the, the vascular tissues of the host and the parasite. And then it starts to store starch in those spidery structures that look a bit like roots, but they're not. And then eventually it's drawn off in enough nutrition to flower and it sends up a shoot in most cases, the parasite will die after flowering. They're generally monocarpic biennials or short-lived perennials um, or annuals. The books will tell you that many species are perennial, but, but in our experience, typically they're not. Here is the full complement of broom rapes and also toothworts, their close relatives that occur in Britain and Ireland. Um, I had the fun task of illustrating every species known to occur here for the BSBI handbook, which I wrote with Fred Rumsey. Here is Fred, Fred Rumsey, a long-standing friend and colleague. We've spent many happy hours in the field looking at broom rapes. 
um, particularly recently when we set out to capture all of our knowledge in the BSBI's handbook to identifying the broom ropes of Britain and Ireland. And we've been um, all over the place to some unusual places, including here the middle of a steelworks to look at an unusual and rare population of, of broom rape growing on private land and to help the owners of that land to conserve and manage the species. Broom rapes do have a reputation for being difficult to identify and in some cases that can be the case. Generally in the UK it's straightforward, less so further afield such as in the Mediterranean, but I've put some examples here on the slide of different taxa which certainly look very similar in, in the field and require careful um, observation. On the left you can see some diagrams which highlight some of the useful features. It's often helpful to look at the corollary in profile to see whether it has um, an evenly arched back to it or is it straight, is it inflicted, inflected at the top. Um, also then you can see the calyx lobes, are they divided, are they not? What's the length of the bract, does it exceed the length of the corolla or not? Then it's always advisable to take a flower, which won't, won't do any harm if you just pull one off, and have a look at the features inside, particularly the filaments. Are they inserted at the very base of the crawler or further up? Are they hairy or not? Then look at the stigma lobes. Are they joined together or are they separate, as in the, the case shown? Are they dark or are they pale? And finally, you can look at the front of the crawler and pay close attention to the upper and the lower lip. Is the upper lip divided? Is the lower lip um, divided into three equal lobes or are they dissimilar? And what does the edge of the corolla look like? Is it, um, is it wavy? Is it toothed or is it entire? Years ago, we did some research that examines the host specificity, particularly in Orobanchi minor, which is a species known to grow on a lot of different host plants. Actually, what we found when we examined populations more closely was that um, specific populations of Orobanchi growing on particular hosts are actually genetically differentiated to an extent. So we were able to recover through looking at um, DNA sequence analysis um, a group of plants that grows on a whole range of hosts, particularly on clovers, um, but we also recovered a, a native clade, so plants that grow on sea carrots, um, as well as a, interestingly, a Mediterranean coastal plant called Orobanchi litterea that, that also grows on, on coastal hosts. Um, so we found evidence that Orobanchi populations growing on different hosts are genetically differentiated. We then set out to grow these in a lab in petri dishes on their preferred hosts and alien hosts and, and to examine um, how they behave. Um, and, and what we found was that there, there was evidence that races are physiologically adapted to specific hosts and also host specificity is um, very much defined by the number of compatible and incompatible interactions at a cellular level. It's very, very complicated, but at a population level, this can lead to the genetic divergence that, that we saw. What does this mean? It means that, for example, Orobanchi populations that grow preferentially on, say, clovers in a chalky field or sea carrots on a sea cliff might be undergoing divergence on their different hosts because those hosts have different ecologies and that's driving the evolution of their divergence in a cryptic way. It's not easy to identify in the field, um, but this is the start of what we call speciation, the process of the evolution of new species. Understanding these processes can inform how we record the plants, how we make sense of their distributions and in some cases conserve them. So we also described a new variety of Orobanchi minor that's specific to brachyglottis shrubs, which are often planted in retail car parks, uh, particularly Ikea for some reason. Um, and so natural populations of Orobanchi have shifted onto hosts in man-made habitats. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these British and Irish species, and I'll start with Orobanchi minor, the one that I've just been talking about, because that really is quite complicated. So, on this slide, you can see photographs of the different forms um, of Orobanchi minor that grow in Britain and Ireland. They are very similar, 
and sometimes virtually impossible to identify reliably in the field, we do know, based on the work that I just described, that they may be physiologically adapted and genetically differentiated. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they look particularly distinct in the field, and, and that's why um, it can be quite confusing. Working from top left, um, that's a, a very normal bog standard Orobanchi minor growing on some clovers. The one with the yellow flowers in the background, that's our Brachyglottis specific one, um, Var heliophylla. Then moving inwards, you've got one that grows on Crepis, um, Var compositarum, compositorum. Um, this tends to have sub-erect, pale and very small corollas, but it's very difficult to tease apart morphologically from other forms. Then on the right, top right, there's a, um, a strongly purple pigmented form that grows on sea holly, and it tends to have a um, a flattish corolla with a geniculate, quite abruptly arched tip and a bilobed upper corolla lip. Um, working our way clockwise, so bottom right there's the subspecies Maritima, which grows on sea carrots around the south coast. And then at the bottom left of the slide you see those yellow forms. Um, these are quite common, they're often um, given the wrong name actually in, in the literature. As, as a varietal status, but actually yellow forms of all Orobanchi um, come up quite commonly. Um, it just so happens that one of them also has a strange sort of subglobose head, so that bottom middle photograph shows uh, a plant that um, has been recorded in several locations around the British Isles that appears to, to be slightly morphologically distinct, but um, it's, it's quite continuous with other yellow forms, to be honest, and we found no evidence of it being genetically distinct. So there you have all the forms of, uh, of Orobanchi minor, a very variable species. Often thought of as scarce, it's actually quite a common plant. This is Orobanchi hedery, um, and it grows in all sorts of environments now. Um, it's often planted, actually, as a curiosity, and it's spread to towns and, and cities. It's particularly common in the Bristol area and, and the southwest, and occasionally you get yellow forms as well. Um, as you move further east, there are some large populations of, of, of the yellow form, former monocroa. The specimens on this slide are far rarer. On the left you see knapweed brimrape Orobanchia latior, and it's locally frequent around chalk, um, particularly chalk pits and disused quarries, places like that around um, the Salisbury Plain, Wiltshire, Oxfordshire, and also the north of Essex and Cambridgeshire. Um, it grows in reasonable quantities, but rarely common. And then um, to the right, you can see Orobanchi rapum genisti, the greater broom rape. This has suffered an enormous decline in the last century, and no one's entirely clear why that is, because it grows on broom and gorse, typically, which are both common still around the British Isles, so we're unclear as to why this has declined. It's very widespread, but, but a very rare species, and it, its outlook is, isn't good. Then to the right of that, that beautiful reddish specimen um, seen here growing on a cliff top in Northern Ireland, that's Orobanchi alba, which has a very strongly western distribution and, and quite local. And finally, you've got Felipanchi, or sometimes still called Orobanchi purpurea, the yarrow brim rape which typically grows around coastal sites um, in, in the south of England, but it, it's not a common species by any means. Now we'll move on to the really rare species. On the left, that beauty is thistle brim rape, Orobanchi reticulata, which grows around Yorkshire on the Magnesian limestone. It's a very rare plant and has a very strange distribution um, in the north of England. Most of the Orobanchis tend to grow further south where conditions are perhaps a little warmer, but this one only grows up there in, in Yorkshire. In the middle, you've got Orobanchi picridis, a famously rare Schedule 8 protected species that grows around the White Cliffs of Dover and, and near Deal on the Isle of Wight. Um, and more recently, we've actually discovered a thriving population on private land, which I'm un unable to say exactly where that is, but we're working with the landowners to, to ensure that we can conserve it effectively. And then on the right, perhaps our rarest of all species, Orobanchi caryophyllacea, the clove-scented brimrape, which famously grows on the sand dunes and the golf course rough um, around Sandwich Bay. It's not a common species at all. There are very few specimens in some years, and, and all of these 
uh, species of orobanchi, they do fluctuate in abundance from year to year. Here are some species that have been introduced to Britain and Ireland. On the left you can see orobanchi crenata, which is a Mediterranean pest that infests pea and bean fields, and it's long been known to occur in Cranham in Essex, um, but more recently several incursions have been discovered in Kent, which is a little bit worrisome for farmers. In the middle you can see Orobanchi leucorum, which grows on Berberis shrubs. It's occasionally been introduced as a botanical curiosity and it persists in, um, in some cases. There's a site where it still grows in Leicestershire. And finally on the right, Orobanchi gracilis, which has been recorded only once at one site in Wiltshire. And it's very unclear how and why it got there. And perhaps it was just um, from windborne seed, but no one really knows um, how it got there and if it's going to be seen again. Many broom rapes are rare or of conservation concern. And they're often neglected from botanic gardens conservation efforts because they're perceived to be difficult or impossible to grow. We've actually had some success stories growing these plants. On the left you can see a beautiful blue specimen of Orobanchi Kiru lessons that we collected seed of in Honshu, Japan. Um, moving from left to right you can see Orobanchi gracilis growing at the University of Bristol Botanic Garden. And then on the right two plants that flowered this year here at Oxford. One is a, a, a rather rare form of Orobanchi minor and then on the right Orobanchi picridis. So these plants can be grown and this gives us hope for the future when it comes to conserving species that may be rare um, or, or threatened in the wild. That brings me to the end of my presentation. This was a pre-recorded talk but if you do have any questions please do get in touch on social media. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram. And thank you for watching.